sharp, steel sharp, T sharp. No time to change, and so have razor blades. Today, Gillette Platinum Plus blades have revolutionized shaving. With a platinum smooth edge that shaves you smoother, closer, and with even more comfort. Hard to believe? Try Gillette Platinum Plus double edge or injector blades in your razor. Find out what it really means to look sharp, feel sharp, and be sharp. Platinum Plus, Gillette, best blade. Well, the Baltimore Orioles are out on the field. Clay are taking his warm-up tosses from the mound. Luke Powell is at first base. Dave Johnson at second. Mark Belanger at short. Brooks Robinson at third base. Lerr Reckman at left field. And Paul Blair in center. Frank Robinson at right. Andy Echebaran behind the plate. And Mike Clay are loosening up on the mound. Anxious to uh, come back in this 1970 World Series and pick up the clinching victory. And to bring you the action. In today's fifth game, first part of the game, it's my pleasure to bring you NBC's Jim Simpson. Thank you, Jim McIntyre. Bobby Tolan, left in a batter, strides in, and this fifth game of the 1970 World Series will start under a light rainfall. As Jim told you, the clouds are breaking up, but showers are in the area and expected to be in the area through tomorrow. This is the World Series, and the fifth game is underway. Baltimore leads three games to one. We are 24-game winner during the regular season. Worked two and a third innings on Sunday, gave up four runs. Three of those were unearned, is ready to pitch to Tolan, a good hitter against left-handed pitchers. Now to the screen. Now, Cuellar, of course, throws the screwball two different kinds. He also has several different kinds of curves, plus the fastball and slider. So he's got about six pitches he can go with and will mix them up. To a right-handed batter, Cuellar being a left-handed pitcher, his screwball will run down and away from the batter. Back as Tolan looks to bunt, runs up the line, and it's a called strike. It's strike two to Bobby Tolan. First man up in this fifth game. The umbrellas are up, and the lights are on here at Memorial Stadium in Baltimore. They play Tolan slightly toward right. They are staring into his catcher, Ellie Hendricks. Throws outside and low, it's one and two. Jim Merritt has just now stopped warming up and is just putting on his jacket out of the bullpen. For Cincinnati, questionable, as Jim said, whether or not he will start today, but he is putting on his jacket. They are back with a one-two pitch. Swing and a miss, strike three. Tolan strikes out. A breaking pitch got Bobby. Here is Pete Rose hitting at 250. One home run in this series, two RBIs, and the captain of the Cincinnati Reds who strides the day to the right side of the plate as Rose is a switch hitter and will bat right-handed against the left-handed Mike Cleon. Stands in, play are ready. The rain continues to fall. Breaking pitches outside ball one. Now, if today's game should become a tie, and then is called off because of rain, something rather unusual would happen. And I'll tell you what it is in just a moment. Ball one pitch from Quayar outside of his ball two. It would be a suspended game. Tomorrow would be an off day. They would go on and play the sixth and seventh games in Cincinnati. And if Cincinnati tied it up, then they would come back to Baltimore and start all over again. Today's game would be washed out in town. Two balls, no strikes to Rose. This is a breaking pitch that's right over the knees. Two balls, one strike. On deck is Tony Perez. He started things off in the eighth inning yesterday, drawing a base on balls after having a strike count on. Setting it up for Bench's single. At Lee Mays, three run home run. Two and one pitch is fouled out of play to the right. There's two balls, two strikes to Rose. So conceivably, if it were a tie today and were called off, and Cincinnati did win the next two at Cincinnati, you could take today's game and throw it all out instead of starting from the point of suspension. Interesting. The ball, two strikes, one out. Cuellar is ready. Fastball, and it's out to right field. On the run is Frank Robinson. will let it down in front of him. Rose goes around as Robinson fumbles the ball. Dives head first into second base. Question is whether or not Pete might have made it anyway. Because he had decided as he went around first base to continue off. It is a hit. Apparently all the way, says the scoreboard. Two bases. Rose going to the opposite field. The ball died very quickly in his heavy air. And as Robinson went to pick it up, he fumbled it. He had already decided to head for a second and did. He made a headlong slide, even though it was not necessary, but of course he wasn't watching the ball. So now Rose is down at second. Tony Perez, a right handed batter. With one hit and 14 tries, 
but a good home run man is up and takes a pitch on the outside corner strike one. During the regular season, Tony Perez hit 40 home runs at 129 RBI. Has had a disappointing series. They already rose off five or six steps at second base. Mike looks back, pitching from the stretch is outside of the next pitch, and it's one and one. Ball game started in a drizzle. Cullen struck out on a breaking pitch. Rose went to the opposite field with a fastball. Lined a double to right. Perez is up. With a count of one ball, one strike, and kneeling on deck is Johnny Bench. We are ready. Ball is fouled out of play to the right. Perez looked as though he wanted to offer. Then held up and fouled the ball off to the right. And the ball came in on him. And he was simply ducking to get out of the way at the last minute. One ball, two strikes. Perez's uniform sliding through that mud is, well, it's a mess is what it is. The front of it. Or the rose. There's a foul at the plate. One ball, two strikes. Keith, you know why, as you have heard many times before, that he even runs out bases on ball. Well, imagine Pete Rose going around first base trying for a double with a play right in front of Frank Robinson who has a fine arm. He was really blocked. They are with a new baseball. Looks back, throws, fastball, it's fouled to the screen right up under us. There is not an exaggerated shift on against uh, the full hitter Perez, but Davey Johnson he is over close to second base. Paul Blair is around to the left in center, and Murr Bretman closer to the line in left. Again, the one-two count. One out, here's the pitch, and it's low. Like a screwball as it ran out and away from Perez. Two balls, two strikes. Most of the umbrellas now have come down, so apparently we can see water dripping off the barrier over our heads in the stadium. Apparently the rain has stopped. They are throws again and just misses. Inside, and it is 3-2. Perez yesterday, remember, drew the walk being down 0-2 and, and then drew the walk to start the eighth inning round. It has won the ball game. There he was one and two, fouled a couple of pitches off, and now Cuellar has missed twice. And now must come in with a pitch on three balls, two strikes. Cuellar ready, throws, ball is lined to left field. Bretman is there, not too deep, now comes in a little bit on one hand and throws to the cutoff man, Belanger, on the line, and rolls stays at second base. Johnny Bench hitting 200, one home run, two RBIs, and the feeling is that when they finally announce it, it could be somebody else, but you talk to those of the press and the players, Johnny Bench will become the youngest man ever to have won the most valuable player award. The voting took place the Friday before the league championship. Hasn't been revealed yet, but I guess the members of the press have been pulling each other saying, whom did you vote for? Throws on at second. First inning, no score. Fifth game of the World Series. Baltimore leads in games, three to one. They are ready to face Johnny Bench, right-handed batter, dead pull hitter. Swing, the breaking pitch. Right. For Bench Johnson is not as close to second base as he played Perez. But they're still pulled around. There's the ball lined over his head. In the right field, Robinson there goes around and will score. Cincinnati leads one nothing on the base hit by Johnny Bench. And that will bring up Lee May, who has been Mr. Everything. And as we look at his batting average, 429, two home runs, and eight RBIs to lead everybody in the series. We wonder what his batting average would be. And what his RBI total would be were it not for Brooks Robinson at third base who has made a practice of robbing it. Two outs. Bench on at first base. And they've got activity out of the Baltimore bullpen. Hit on the fifth. Deep back goes Redman to the wall and left. Looks up. Off the wall. Around second on the way to third. Is the runner Johnny Bench. And he holds at third as in at second with a double is Lee May. If that ball had been out a little bit more over the plate, May would have pulled that for a two-run home run. Nearly jammed and very quickly, George Bamberger, the pitching coach, 
walks out to talk to Mike Cuellar, and they've got activity. Looks like a right-hander going in the bullpen down there for Baltimore. Baltimore has Tom Phoebus, who might have started a day's game, or if we are not ready, warming up already. So Tolan, as Bamberger now prepares to leave the mound, Tolan struck out swinging. He throws it a fastball to right for a double. Perez fly to short left. Johnny Bench followed with a single to right, going to the opposite field, and we said he's a dead full hitter, but he went to the opposite field. Driving in rows with the first run, and Lee May hit the first pitch and doubled off the left field wall. Bench stopping at third. Two out, Hal McRae hitting 500. The two of Bernie Carbo out of left field, right-handed batter, steps in. We are ready to throw to Hal McRae. Now back to the screen. Two out, first base open. Tommy Helms on deck. One to nothing to score. Jim, I think Cuellar has thrown uh, quite a few screwballs in this first inning already, and that pitch may be the one that's giving his elbow a little trouble. Cuellar looks. Now throws off the corner. And again, looks like the screwball that Jim was talking about as it ran down and away from Hal McGray. Well, McGray, Blair, is in a more pronounced pull at center field than he was for Perez or Bench. Back with the fastball, and look out, Alex Grammis, the coach at third base. Went right between his legs as he skipped out of the way in the coaching box. Foul. One ball, two strikes to McGray. One to nothing to score. Three base hits off Mike Cuellar, 24-game winner, who only lasted two and a third innings in Cincinnati on Sunday. Ready to throw. Ball is hit to center field, and Blair is pulled over toward left, so this will go by him, and two runs will score. McGray has speed. Blair up with the ball off the wall. McGray will stop at second. It is three to nothing, Cincinnati. Blair was pulled to the left, not playing straightaway center, and the ball went to right center field. It rolled all the way to the wall. Jim uh, McGray stumbled as he rounded first and got about a third of the way down to second base, or else he might have tried for three. As you pointed out, he could run, has pretty good speed, and might have tried for a triple had he not stumbled. As it is, he's at second base. Tommy Helms is going to be the batter, and uh, out of the mound, that's fair, and I have to think uh, Burrow Weaver might pop out of that dugout any time. Well, Mike Cuellar gave up two runs in the second game uh, for the World Series in the first inning. But those, remember, were all runners. He's being tagged here, and there have been no base hits that you can say, well, that one had eyes, or that one just fell in. They have been line driving the base hits of Mike Cuellar. The Gray's in scoring position, the potential fourth one. Helms right-handed batter swings on the first pitch, ground ball to Belanger, up with it on the short hop, goes on the first base, and Cuellar and the Orioles are out of the inning. But three runs score on a total of four hits. No errors, one left. As we go to the last of the first, Cincinnati already leads three to nothing. You're impatient for the morning And you must have something new Dice of Plymouth Come and There's a little bit of magic In a car that's making blue And we put it on for you. This is Lewis coming through with Crash the Plymouth. Be sure and see that great new Plymouth Seabrain. Take it from Satchmo, it's the greatest. Crash the Plymouth. Come and say. For 1971, Chrysler Plymouth offers more kinds of new cars than anyone else in the business. Why not let a Chrysler or a Plymouth come through for you? Well, you have to uh, wonder if uh, Mr. Cuellar is going to be around very long. Uh, Tom Beavis is continuing to throw in the Baltimore bullpen. And uh, as we mentioned before the game, uh, perhaps both managers are running somewhat of a risk. Uh, Jim Merritt, who's had elbow problems, is out at the mound, beginning to uh, warm up, start the last half of the first inning, setting the red for you defensively. At first base, Lee May. At second base, Tommy Helms. Davy Concepcion at shortstop, Tony Perez, third base, with Al McRae in left, 
Bobby Tolan in center and Pete Rose in right. Behind the plate, Johnny Bench and left-hander Jim Merritt, who was a 20-game winner on the mound. And you have to think that Jim is going to try to let it out to all the way here in the first inning, and then uh, we'll have to see how his elbow uh, responds. Three to nothing, the Reds are leading as we come to the last half of the first inning, game five. The Orioles lead it three games to one. And for the uh, words I view, bottom half of inning number one, here again, Jim Simpson. Thank you, Jim. Mark Belanger, Paul Blair, Frank Robbins to lead it off against uh, Jim Merritt. Phoebus has now stopped warming up out of the bullpen for Baltimore. And as we look around, because as we said, we are under an abutment here in the press box at Baltimore, and water drips down off that abutment. Sometimes we feel it's raining, sometimes we don't know if it is or not. So as we look down, we do see some umbrellas up. Some, not a lot. So apparently it's still drizzling. Belanger is only one for 14 in the series, hitting 0-71. And Cincinnati has a 3 nothing lead. Remember, the Reds had a 3 nothing lead in the first game and a 4 nothing lead in the second game and lost both. The way these two ball clubs did, it's not over yet. Merritt ready, left-handed throws, and the ball is fouled off to the left. Perez starts after it, and then Keyes is going to drift very deep off third base into the seat. Paul Blair is on deck. Merritt, like some of your other stars around the major leagues, has been around baseball for a long while in that he was a clubhouse boy for the Los Angeles Dodgers. So oh, he has realized his dream. Merritt ready, tall left-hander throws. All strike. Belanger ran his hands up to that as if to bunt, as Perez was rather deep at third base. Merritt, while with Minnesota, had a four and six record against the Orioles. Of course, he came over to Cincinnati in that trade for Leo Cartman, who now plays shortstop for Minnesota. Fine trade for both clubs. Belanger waits, takes inside and low, two and one. Balls, one strike to Belanger, the leadoff batter for Baltimore in the last of the first. Al McGray doubled in two runs in that first inning. Johnny Ben single in one. There's a line drive almost grabbed by Billy Hunter, but he happens to be the coach at third base for Baltimore, so it wouldn't have counted. George Stoller, the coach over at first base. Belanger back in, has a closed stance, right-handed batter. When he hits a home run, Baltimore goes into fake swoon. This one is popped up, left side, Perez in foul territory. Waiting there, right alongside of him, is Dave Concepcion, the shortstop, and it's one out. Perez makes the put out. Here's Paul Blair hitting at 400, two RBIs, three runs scored. Right handed batter. He made the first for Cincinnati, Tommy Helms at second. Dave Concepcion, the shortstop. Johnny Perez at third, Hal McRae in left, Bobby Tolan in center, Pete Rose in right, Johnny Bench the catcher, and Jim Merritt, 20 game winner today, starter for the Reds, throwing to Blair, and it's blind foul down the left field line. Strike one. It rains very heavily this morning, and then about 12.31, about a half an hour before the game is scheduled to start, they started taking the tarp off, and then as the game began, it began to drizzle again. Merritt is back inside and low. It's one and one. To Blair. And as we said, apparently it is still drizzling a little bit now. If Cincinnati wins today, tomorrow travel day, and they resume with a six game as a fastball high and away. And it's two and one to Blair. They resume with a six game on Saturday in Cincinnati. Jim, that pitch there, that fastball of Blair is the hardest merit has thrown it so far. Two balls, one strike. Back with a breaking pitch. There's the bunch down at third base line, waiting for it to roll foul as Perez, and then gloved it as it does after going about 60 feet from home plate. And Blair, who has fine speed, is way down the line and is just now walking back past first base. Trying to butt his way off. 2-2, two -two, the count. 3 to nothing. the score, Cincinnati. Lights have been on since the start of the game. They play Blair, who has World Series home runs for his credit, swung around to left. Blair won a game with a home run in 1966 when the Orioles swept the Los Angeles Dodgers in four. Two balls, two strikes. Merritt ready. Blair ready. Here's the pitch, and this one is lined in the left field. In quickly is Al McRae, who can run. Five for the catch. And he is safe. He drops it, they say. But what? You couldn't tell from here, but down the left field line, now it's a legal fire. Cody Benson ran clear out near McRae and called the play. 
Well, the 3 2 pitch to Robinson from Merritt was just too good for Frank and not so good for Merritt. Ready again. Fastball line, but it is pulled foul. And I want to tell you, Mr. Redman really got around on that ball. Merv has excellent power. Had 18 home runs during the regular season. They say about Earl Weaver and Baltimore, not only does Weaver have a great starting lineup, but look down that bench with Merv Redman, Kirk Moten, one of the hottest pinch hitters in baseball. Young Terry Crowley outside with the pitch is Merritt. Two balls, one strike to Merv Redman. They play him to pull. Merritt back on 2-1 breaking pitch, and he swings on it and pops it up to the left side. Perez is there. He is waved off by Concepcion, who makes his second consecutive out and the third of the inning. But two-run score on two hits, including Frank Robinson's homer. Nobody left. At the end of one complete, we've got a dandy. Cincinnati 3, Baltimore 2. I'm a casual kind of guy, I swear. If you can't tell by my guitar, you can sure tell by my hair. You see, I don't go spoiling it with things out of bottles and tubes, or even water out of a spout. So, feeling the way I do, I never thought I'd see the day when I'd say, Hey, here's something for my hair that's really a groove. Let me tell you about it. It's the thing called the dry look, made by Gillette. It's dry control in an aerosol can. You comb your hair till it looks just right. Then put on the dry look, and your hair will still look dry. Full, casual, and clean. And if you want just a little dry control, or maybe a little more, or even more, the dry look gives it to you, because there's a special three-way valve on top. You set the right degree of dry control for you. So take my advice and try the dry look. Yeah, the wet head is dead. Long live the dry look from Gillette. We pause 30 seconds for station identification. Listen to your windshield, my baby. Could be they're telling you that they've had it. That they can't do their job anymore. That you should do something about it. If so, you know. And go. The windshield wiper people make the best wipers, best blades, best refills you can buy. Look for them in the bright yellow cabinet in good service stations everywhere. AQ, AM and FM Chicago, home of the Pat Sheridan Show. And takes a call strike. Mike Bayard has got off the second inning. Along with Jim McIntyre, this is Jim Simpson. The score is 3-2 to two, Cincinnati, and we're just at the top of the second. Concepcion has had a fine series. Two for six and three RBIs, hitting 3-33. Picks on a changeup and grounds a foul past Alex Ramos, the coach at third base. Ted Kozuski coaches over at first base for Cincinnati. No activity now in the Baltimore bullpen, but Cuellar had a mighty rough first inning, giving up four hits. Back with the pitch, high fastball, and it's one ball, two strikes. Game started in a drizzle, and now we look out, and we see no umbrellas up anywhere, so apparently it has stopped. Very difficult to tell from the fastball as lines foul to the right and into the box seats. Still one ball, two strikes. Concepcion has been hitting to the opposite field but with great success. And they played him that way, not too deep, and swung around to the right. Despite the fact he is a right-handed batter going against the left-handed Cuellar. They are ready. One and two to count outside, and see, Dave wanted to swing at that one, almost jumped across the plate, but then saw it go outside and took it for ball two. Cincinnati leads by a run in the top of the second. Fastball, it's out to short right field, and back goes Davy Johnson, taps his glove, and then takes it on the dead run for out number one of the second inning. And that will bring up Jim Merritt. Merritt as a batter in the majors has a lifetime average of 142. That's pretty good. Four home runs, one last season up in New York. Merritt. And this year, three of them at Atlanta, San Diego, and in Cincinnati. Strike as he swings. 0-1 to Jim Merritt. They are ready to work again with left-handed batting Merritt, and this is outside low. For, it is ball one, one and one. 
Jim Merrick, Ferguson Jenkins, and Johnny Odom, the only pitchers in the major leagues who hit as many as three home runs in 1970. One ball, one strike. Three to two to score Cincinnati. Fastball is up high from three are. It is two and one. One out. Top of the second inning. They play Merritt to pull slightly, which is a tribute to him. He grounds this ball down the first baseline, gloved by Powell. Foul, and he tosses back to play off. Mike was over near first, preparing to cover, of course, had the ball been fair. So it's 2 2. First inning for Cincinnati, with one out, Rose lined a double to right. Johnny Bent scored him with a single with two out, and Lee May doubled. Bent's going to third, and then Hal McRae doubled to center to drive in two more. Swing, a miss. Held on to by Echeverin, and it's strike three. Merritt is down the second strikeout to Mike Cuellar. And here is the man he struck out to start off the ball game, Bobby Tolan. Struck out, swinging on a breaking pitch. Tolan has a home run in the series, one RBI. Takes the ball inside from Cuellar, ball one. Bobby successfully has stolen the base and has been caught stealing. He, as you know, led the major leagues in stolen bases with 57. One ball pitch is down low, and Bill Williams, kneeling down on the inside shoulder of catcher Andy Etcher and shakes his head. No, it's ball two. Tolan has something in his eye and backs off for a moment. Now steps in. Cuellar throws. Ground ball. One, one big hop to Booth Fowler simply steps on the first base to end the inning. No run hits or errors. Anybody left? We go to the last of the second. Cincinnati three, Baltimore two. What gets a team to the World Series? Performance. Performance that shows up game after game. In clutch situations, that makes the difference between winning and losing. Well, it's like that auto racing, too. And the name of the performer that comes through race after race is STP Oil Treatment. STP Oil Treatment means championship performance for race cars and for family cars, too. Because STP works in all engines to cut the heat, friction, and wear that can put your car on the sidelines with expensive repairs. STP clings to vital engine parts, lubricates better than ordinary motor oil alone, helps keep your car running smoother, quieter, longer. That's the kind of championship performance you can appreciate every day. And now that winter's coming, you should remember that STP gives you the extra edge your car needs to start faster in cold morning. So the first time you need oil, or the next time you change oil, have your service station add STP oil treatment. STP is the racer's edge. A big round of applause uh, is for Brooks Robinson, who's going to be the Oriole leadoff man in the uh, second inning. I have to think, Jim, that uh, your observation was that this could be a high-scoring ball game. You said that before we went on the air, and with both pitchers having some problems with their arms, and, and what has happened so far, uh, looks like you're going to be right on the money. Now, Jim, here's a fellow that's driven in six runs thus far in the series, Brooks Robinson. Hitting 500, 8 for 16, and of course has been amazing a deal with a glove. Now ready to work to him and throws outside and high. It is ball one. Brooks yesterday went four for four in a losing cause. The last American League player to do that was Bill Dickey of the Yankees back in 1938. Ball one pitch is catching the inside corner. Breaking pitch looks like a slider from Merrick. One ball, one strike. Well, a year ago when the New York Mets were taking Baltimore in five games. Brooks Robinson had one hit in 19 times at bat. He's eight for 16. One and one pitch is fouled off to the right. Lee May gives chase over near the box seats. Down off first base, but it is at least 20 rows back. One ball, two strikes to Brooks Robinson with Davey Johnson swinging a couple of bats in the on-deck circle. Brooks, from the time that ball was fouled off, never stood out of the batter's box, never stepped out, just stood there with the bat ready to face Jim Merritt. Who owns a three to two lead when we're in the last of the second? Merritt throws one and two, breaking pitch. Line to left field. Back goes Al McRae looking up and takes it, running away from the plate toward left center field. But Brooks Robinson is really getting wood on that baseball in this series. Here is Davey Johnson hitting at 167 in the series. Setup. 
Three runs, four hits, no errors for Cincinnati with a big blow for them. A two-run double by Hal McRae. Two runs, two hits, no errors for Baltimore. And the big hit for Baltimore, the two-run homer by Frank Robinson with one out in the first inning. Merrick stares into his catcher, Johnny Bench. Johnson, right-handed batter, waits and fouls the first one back toward us over our heads. Strike one. Andy Etcheberry has walked out and is dealing on deck. Wayne Granger is still throwing. He was throwing back in the first inning, remember? After Robinson lined that ball to left field, he got up and started throwing again. Low and away with the pitch. Bench takes it out of the dirt. It's one ball, one strike to Dave Johnson. Granger, right-hander, had 35 saves for Cincinnati this year. One and one. Fastball is outside. It's two balls, one strike. Umbrellas are up again, and it's drizzling again. And if you're just joining us, it rained most of the morning in Baltimore, and we are to get occasional showers today, tonight, and tomorrow. The game started in the drizzle, and it hasn't been held up yet. Two balls, one strike. Lights are on. This pitch is inside. Backing him out of there. It's three balls, one strike. So Johnson looks down to Billy Hunter, the coach at third base, to see what it is he can do. Can he swing on 3-1? Will that's a Baron do up, or does he take? They pull Davy to pull. They play him around to the left. Merritt is ready. Johnson had 10 home runs during the regular season, low and away, and Johnson draws the first walk of the ball game. Jim watching Johnny Bench indicates that Jim Merritt. Uh, when Merrick gets in trouble control-wise, it's because he doesn't throw right off over the top. Andy Etcheberry caught a game, didn't get a hit in four tries, takes the breaking pitch and swings on it, and it is bobbled at third base by Billy Hunter, the coach, who keeps it in play. Billy missed it and then figured out go with the gag and began to deliberately bobble the ball and then throw it back to Merrick. Strike one. The Hatcher with Johnson on it first and one out in the last of the second. Cincinnati leads three to two. Jim Merritt, because of the rain here, was having trouble while warming up in the bullpen and the same time of trouble on the mound, and that is getting mud in his spikes, and has to take time out to get the mud out of there so he can get good footing to throw to Hatcher Barron. One strike pitch ready as he looks over at first base, throws a breaking pitch, and just does miss. It's one ball, one strike to Hatcher Barron. Etcheberry played in 78 games, splitting the catching duties during the regular season with Ellie Hendricks, and hit 243. He was in the 1966 series. Last ball, and he swings and misses at strike two. One ball, two strikes. Etcheberry with Mike Cuellar on deck. Funny thing about Cuellar, remember Dave McNally the other day hitting a grand slam home run? First time a pitcher's ever done it. In the World Series, Mike Cuellar had a grand slam home run in the league championships against Minnesota. One ball, two strikes. That's ready. Fastball right up the middle. Base hit. Right past Merrill. Down the second goes Davy Johnson and stops there. Runners at first and second. We are coming up to that. Baltimore trails three to two. The tying run is now down at second base. And Cuellar is up to bat, taking a look down to Billy Hunter to see what it is. And Helms and Concepcion check with each other about what they're going to do should the ball be hit to either one of them. Perez is in on the home plate side of third base. May moves in close to the grass at first base. And Helms and Concepcion play back for the double play. They are left-handed batter. Swings and line runs to right field. Rose comes over, makes a fine catch on the run, and then throws behind the runner. But Johnson is back at second base. That had base hit written all over it, but Rose was playing rather shallow and not playing Cuellar to pull too much and ran to his right and made the catch. Now Sparky Anderson, after seeing that happen, walks out to talk to Merrick. Anderson, of course, doesn't want this ball game to get away. Not that it's anywhere near being over. We are just in the last of the second. But with Belanger coming up and Mike Cuellar, a left-handed pitcher, throwing against, or batting against the left-handed Jim Merritt and getting that kind of wood on the ball. And remember, the other out was a line drive off the bat of Brooks Robinson that McRae made a fine catch on in left field. Sparky has said, that's all for you, Jim Merritt. I am going to...
to the ball set. Jim Merritt will leave. The two runners on are charged to him. He gave up a total of three hits and thus far two runs. And Jim McIntyre, that is going to be Wayne Granger, who's coming in. That's right, and uh, this has got to be the earliest that Wayne has ever been called into a game in 1970. Uh, I cannot recall any game in which Granger relieved as early as the second inning. Say, do you want to quit school? Read the water ads first. You'll find that most employers look for high school graduates and get them because seven out of ten people hunting for jobs have finished high school. If you're in school, better stay there. If you quit, see your state employment service or youth opportunity center. To get a good job, get a good education. I uh, have to think, uh, Jim, that, that Merritt may have been trying intentionally to get the ball up to Cuellar, expecting him to push the button down the third base side to move the runners up a notch. But uh, Earl Weaver tried to cross up the strategy and had his pitcher swing away, and as you pointed out, he hit a grand slam home run against the Twins. And with the ball up and out over the plate, uh, he had a good pitch to swing at, and he hit it pretty hard. That he did, Jim. Wayne Granger, who strides it now, we told you, 35 saves during the regular season. In his only series appearance, he worked only two-thirds of an inning, and Baltimore roughed him up pretty good. Two hits, three earned runs. Thanks to a home run by Baltimore, also walked man and a man and struck out a man. But Wayne Granger, of course, a big man in the Cincinnati bullpen and in the scheme of things, because it's the Cincinnati bullpen that brought the Reds through. Whereas, conversely, Baltimore is known for its starting pitchers, the big three, Cuellar, who won 24, McNally, who won 24, and Jim Palmer, who won 20. Jim Merritt, who started this game, had 20 victories for Cincinnati to lead that team. Gary Nolan had 18, and one wonders what... Wayne Simpson might have been able to do had he not experienced injuries in his shoulder. He already had won 14 when he left in July. Well, two are out. Johnson, the tying run down at second. Echeverron on at first. Mike Belanger, who is now one for 15, trying to drive the runner in. Keep this rally going, and he's facing the right-handed Wayne Granger. Pitch is inside to him. Ball up. Belanger, right-handed hitter. Three to two Cincinnati in a game that is already about 40 minutes old. And we're just now in the last of the second inning. There's been a lot of scoring. They're playing Belanger not to pull the ball, but to push it toward right if he does connect with it. Sidearm fastball is outside. It is two and all. Oh. Belanger, who quickly looks down to Billy Hunter to check to see whether or not to take another one or swing it. He tries to get it over. Two are out. Blair waits on deck. Belanger chokes up considerably on the bat. Not known for the long ball. Another fastball. And that's what it's going to be. Third base comes out to the cut. But Gray comes in and simply tosses to Concepcio on a third of the tie game. And Belanger, who was one for 15, swings on the two-hole pitch and lines the single left. That run, of course, is charged to Merritt. Second base, he is also Merritt's responsibility, and here is Paul Blair. For the power hitting Paul Blair takes the curveball on the outside, strike one. No activity in the Cincinnati bullpen. And now, someone is running out to go into the Cincinnati bullpen, and Jim McIntyre is putting the glasses on him to see who it is. Has his jacket on at the moment. It looks like Tony Plantinger, Jim. Well, we said it yesterday, and it's been said almost in every World Series in this situation. There is no tomorrow. Cincinnati must win today, and calling her a starting pitcher. There's a fly. He's to the line. That's a one. Comes around third. The gray is up. He's going home. And he's off the mark, backed up by Granger. Baltimore has the lead. Wayne Granger has been up two base hits in a row. Robinson, who had a home run on a 3-2 pitch. 
it last time up. At one time, the most valuable player in the National League and rookie of the year for Cincinnati. And now batting against them. Groninger is up and throwing in the bullpen. Breaking pitch is out of the way. Vince has to go to his right knee to dig it out. Ball one to Frank Robinson. Robinson worked Jim Nurse to start at a 3-2 and then fell to a high home run deep in the stands in left field. Baltimore down 3 to nothing as they were in the first game of the series, has come back and now leads 4-3. Sidearm pitches hit up in the air high. In center field, Bobby Tillman waits for it to come down. And has it for the third out. But two runs score on three hits. No errors and two left. At the end of two, Baltimore 4, Cincinnati 3. The following dedicated to all you folks out there who have corrected Winston's grammar. Winston may not say it right, but they sure know how to make it right. Hey, but if you want to get in on a terrific deal, listen to this. You know the Gillette Techmatic Razor, the razor that gets the knobs? Well, here's the deal. Right now, when you buy the Gillette Techmatic Razor, America's top-selling razor, you get a can of Gillette Foamy Shave Cream with lemon lime, free. You get that? Foamy with lemon lime, free. So what are you waiting for? Get the Gillette Techmatic Razor now. A deal like this don't live forever. Jim Simpson, this is Jim McIntyre at Memorial Stadium in Baltimore, where the Orioles have taken a 4-3 lead. The Reds jumped out in front with three runs in the first inning, but cannot stand prosperity. A two-run homer by Frank Robinson, and singles uh, behind a walk to Johnson by Etzebarra and Belanger and Blair, and here we are, Baltimore lead, number 4-3, third inning, here's Jim. Pete Rose doubled right on a fastball back in the first inning and came home on the single by Johnny Bench. Batting right-handed against the left-handed Cuellar and swings on the first pitch and fouls and that's the place to strike one. Well, this is where the trouble begins when you talk about the Cincinnati Reds. The National Leaguers can tell you about it. So can the Baltimore Orioles. Rose, Perez, Bench, May. In the third inning, back with the breaking pitch. It is down low. It is one and one. Pete Rose. Four to three to score. Baltimore was down three nothing as they were in the first game of the series. We are just starting the third inning. Fastball this time. It is hit to the right side. Johnson is there. Sidearm throw to foul and Rose is out by twenty. That'll bring up Tony Perez, who battled way out to a three-two count back in the first, but then lifted a lazy fly to Merv Redman out in left field. That's the four benches single. Hayes double and the Gray's double. We said, Tony Perez with tremendous home run power. We are throws in on him. It's too far inside, and it's ball one. It's 40 home runs, 129 RBIs, and in the regular season, you cannot discount those. Big man, good power. Here's the ball one pitch, and this is hit to left field on the line. Redman is over, staying low with him. Redman recognized that as a sinking line drive and came over with his knees down low, his body bent forward toward the ball and stayed right with it and took it just a couple of feet off the ground. Did not come in toward home plate, but rather toward the foul line and left. Here's Johnny Bench, who singled in the run back in the first inning. Baltimore now leads by run. Bench right-hander against Cuellar. Where's hit the ball pretty well. Cuellar is ready. Fastball foul to the screen. Tom Phoebus up and throwing again. Earl Weaver got the case of the Worries when he saw Perez hit that ball that well. Cuellar is ready back for the breaking pitch, but it's too low. Bounces up and Rose catches it and turns to Billy Williams jump higher and says, how about that? Get that ball in play or throw it out, and Williams is going to throw it out. Again, we say hello to you around the world listening on American Forces Radio, wherever you are, Vietnam, Korea, Japan, Europe, the Caribbean, or on our United States ships at sea. Cuellar is back with the breaking pitch, and there is strike two. Rose started to offer by the bench started to offer, did not, and it dropped over for a strike. 
One ball, two strikes. Series game has a lot of tradition behind it. All of the great teams have played in this series, and every year more great names join those of the past. Here's something else that's got tradition going for it: STP Oil Treatment. STP has given drivers the edge on great race circuits all over the world, and it doesn't stop there. Millions and millions of motorists rely on STP Oil Treatment every day to keep their family cars running smoother, quieter, longer. STP clings to vital engine parts, lubricates better than motor oil alone ever could. Helps eliminate uh, damaging friction and wear. On the track, that can give you the winning edge. On the highway, it can mean a lot longer life for your engine. And with winter coming up, you need STP protection even more. Because STP gives you the extra lubrication you need to help get smooth, fast starts on cold mornings. So get that STP tradition working for you. At your service station, add a can of STP oil treatment to your car's engine and run racer sharp. We pause 30 seconds for station identification. The new hidden windshield wiper blade needs your attention just as much as those resting on the glass. It's easy to forget them when they're out of sight. If they were streaking last time out, replace or refill them with new Anco wiper blades or refills. Where we see the bright yellow Anco cabinet, the man at the pump can do the job in seconds. It's a good place to buy gas, too. WMAQ AM and FM Chicago, home of the Pat Sheridan Show. Along with Jim Simpson, this is Jim McIntyre. We're ready for the ball of our half of the third inning. The Orioles in front, four to three. And here's Jim as Boop Powell steps up. Concepcion at shortstop made a good play on Boop Powell, catching his pop fly, running away with his back to the plate back in the first inning. Now the left hander against the right handed Granger. And remember, Belanger and Blair on the Granger fastballs lined singles. To left field, both men pull the ball. Belanger seldom does that. Boone Powell with great power, and he is standing at the left side of the plate, looking at the three-quarter and sidearm throws of Granger, who throws him a breaking pitch inside. Lee May at first base, Tommy Helms at second, Dave Concepcion at short, Tony Perez is the third baseman for the Reds, Al McRae in left, Bobby Tolan in center, Pete Rose in right, Johnny Vince the catcher, Granger throwing another breaking pitch. This one is a curveball that drops right over strike one to Boo Powell. It's one and one. On deck is Merv Wetman. 309 feet down each foul line and then dropping away dramatically to 410 feet straight away center field. Ranger ready. There's the ball. Rips the right field. He throws his on his way back. Watches it go by. Not going to get the ball to the ball. There's the long throw to the second base, but nobody is there to cover. And it is cut off. coming up. Milt Wilcox, the young 20-year-old youngster, is getting up to throw, and very quickly Johnny Bench walks out to talk to Wayne Granger. Slow things down just a little bit. Rettman is ready. Four to three to score Baltimore. They were down three to nothing. Booth now down at second base with none out. And Rettman and Bruce Robinson do up. Rettman Swung on a curveball from Merritt back in the first inning and popped up Concepcion. Swings here, fouls the ball at the plate at strike one. Jim, uh, the last three or four times that we've seen Wayne Granger pitch, he has been getting the ball up. And when he gets the ball up, he's in trouble. He has to throw the sinking fastball, and he has to start it out down around the knees. Ranger peering into the bench, looking back now to Booth Powell, throws sidearm fastball that is low, and it is one of one. And Laura Breckman, who looks down to Billy Hunter, the coach at third base. Cincinnati got three runs in the first inning, Baltimore two in the first, and two more in the second. We are now in the last of the third. Lights are on, it is not drizzling. Ranger three-quarter motion, fastball, up the middle. Comes a throw from Cronin, the home plate. Gets his waiting. Powell is safe. And down the second on the throw. Tony Gretman. Five to three. Powell slid right between the legs of Johnny Bench. And his foot hit the plate just as Bench got the ball. Five men have given 
out three singles and a double. Parky Anderson is on his way out. Baltimore has the lead. That slide at the home plate by Big Boo Powell was something to see. He went right between Johnny Bench's legs and planted that left foot on home plate as Bench made the tag up on his shoulders and was called safe by playing up by Billy Williams, which indeed he was. And I have to think that the smaller man may not have made it. But uh, Bill Powell at 250 plus with a full head of steam was pretty hard to stop. And Bench just couldn't do the job. Johnny's a pretty good sized boy, but not that big. After a conference with Ranger, uh, Sparky Anderson has headed back to the dugout. Young uh, Bill Wilcox certainly has not had time enough to get loose in the bullpen. But uh, you have to think that if Robinson is retired and happens to hit the ball hard, Wilcox would be in there. Now, Brooks Robinson lined to left field back in the second inning. But that was off left-hander Jim Merritt. He's now 8 for 17 in the series with six RBIs, gets a curveball, and fouls it off to the right. And maybe much of that talking between Anderson Bench and Granger had to do with what do you do with Brooks Robinson? Or remember what we said we're going to do with Brooks Robinson. Or don't throw too many of those fastballs, it's not working for you. In any event, Bill Wilcox continues to throw. There's a fastball, sidearm pitch, that is outside and low, it is one and one to Brooks Robinson. Gretman single, drove in Boo Powell, who just made a dandy slide, and Merv went on down to second base on the throw by Tolan to home. Still nobody out. Last to the third, five to three Baltimore. Fifth game of the series, breaking pitch. Line drive, one hop off the the man at first base, Brooks Robinson, but with one out, Merv Whitman has moved on to third base. And that brings up Davey Johnson, who walked. Now, Brooks Robinson did not get a base hit. Did hit the ball well, gets the hand, but he has also done this. He has hit the ball to the other side of the field, has moved the runner along to third base. And that is all you can ask of anyone. So now a fly ball, or a ground ball to the infield very deep, or of course the base hit, or miscue of any kind, could score. Wetman from third base with the sixth Baltimore run. Davey Johnson took a pitch for ball four after working with count to 3-1 and scored a hit of the Langers hit back in the second inning. Tall strike, Johnson. Billy Williams, the umpire behind the plate from the National League. Emmett Ashford in his first World Series stationed at first base. Ken Burkhardt of the National at second. John Flaherty of the American... At third base, Tony Benson of the National League in left field and Bob Stewart in right field from the American League. Fastball, sidearm pitches outside. One ball, one strike to Dave Johnson. Redman at third, one out. Five to three to score Baltimore. We are in the last of the third on an overcast day in a game that started in the rain. Baltimore wins today. The 1970 World Championship belongs to the Orioles. If not, we go to Cincinnati for game six on Saturday. Sidearm fastball is too high. And as Jim McIntyre pointed out, Granger's having trouble keeping it down low, and that one was certainly up high. Up above the letters. Wilcox continues to throw. Sloniger has been throwing in the bullpen for Cincinnati. Sidearm pitch again, fastball. In the hole between third and short. Johnson has an RBI.
big uh, factor in the Cincinnati Reds pitching plans for 1971. But right now, the worry uh, for uh, Sparky Anderson and the Cincinnati Reds is centered around uh, Andy Echeverin and uh, pitcher Mike Cuellar, who uh, has had some problems himself that seems to have settled out. The Reds went in front with three in the first, and uh, like uh, the first two games when they were in front, uh, three to nothing and four to nothing, don't uh, seem to stand up under the pressure of having a lead. As we said, only one third of an inning of pitching for Wilcox. He allowed three hits and two runs, both earned, didn't walk anybody, didn't strike anybody. Out. And uh, he was the losing pitcher in that ball game, the second game on, uh, uh, was on Sunday. Wilcox appeared in five games, pitched one shutout against the Dodgers at Dodgers Stadium this year. Won three and lost one, and also had one save working in relief. He pitched 22 and a third innings for the season, allowed 19 hits and six earned runs, allowed two home runs, walked seven, and struck out 15. And he'll first, uh, face first, Andy Etcheberry. Jim McIntyre, uh, Milt Wilcox is now taking his winning warm-ups as kneeling in the on-deck circle still. He is Andy Etcheverin, who singled and scored a run ahead of Blair's single back in the second inning. It is six to three. Well, again, as Jim has pointed out about being behind, Baltimore, as we will point out again, was down by three runs, three to nothing, in the first game and came back to win it, four to three. Then they were down four to nothing in the second game and came back to win it, six to five. Today, they were very quickly down, three to nothing, without even having come to bat in the first inning of this ball game. But now they lead by three, six to three. As Andy Etcheverin steps up, Davey Johnson, who is just scored Bretman from third base with a sharp single to left field, was out. Ranger gave up two runs. Dave Johnson his responsibility on five hits. Wilcox in the league championships, I'm sure you know, Final game against Pittsburgh, the third game, was just simply an amazingly good-looking right-handed pitcher. The Reds figure that despite a serious performance, he is one of the good ones for next year and years to come. He's only 20. Ready with the first pitch, off-speed pitch. It breaks right over the plate. Outside corner, strike one. They're playing at Chabon, who single to center to pull to all the left. Now a quick throw, but... Johnson's only about a half a step off at first base, and there's right there as Lee May tosses the ball back to Wilcox. Merritt started. Ranger came on in the second. Now Wilcox in the third of the six to three ball game. Wilcox ready, throws, fastball, hit on him, and apparently he went around with the swing. Etchebaron is asking, Did I go around? He looks down to Billy Hunter, but it's strike two. Mike Cuellar is on deck, the pitcher. Who was down three to nothing and now finds himself leading by three, breaking pitches much too high. Bench has to stand up and reach up to get it. Ball one, strike two. Well, coming to the stadium this morning, I wouldn't have given you much chance at all that this game would be played, even though they do everything in their power to play World Series games. It was raining that hard. But the closer we got, the better the weather was, and we're playing the game. Pitch is off the corner. Changed up, it's 2-2. The game started in a drizzle, and it has been drizzling off and on several times since. Atchabar, the right-handed hitter, waits. Right-handed Wilcox, Wilcox throws. Ball hits to the opposite field, high to right field. He throws, crops toward the line. Now gets under it and has it for the second out. Johnson moves back to first base, and Mike Cuellar, who lined the right field on the first pitch, and he saw the second inning is the bat. They are won 24 and lost eight during the regular season. Had that grand slam home run, remember, at Minnesota. Wilcox throws to him. Cleyard's left handed all the way. Swings at an inside pitch and fouls it right at the plate. Mike is not a great hitting pitcher. Overall average is 116. There are some pitchers who would settle for that. But the rule of thumb for a good hitting pitcher is if he hits right around 200. He's hit four home runs in his career, two in the regular season, 1970. 
One at Kansas City, another at Detroit, that he had a grand slam home run in the playoffs. Clear may have shaken himself up a little bit when he swung and fouled that ball at the plate. He is still walking around. The ball might have gone off his right shin. And now quickly, uh, Salvone comes out, the trainer, to see how he is. Looks like the ball went right off his right foot, Jim. Either his right foot or his right shin, Jim. I think you were probably right there taking a look at his right shin bone. And uh, Wilcox, man, there's a... Some of that, what is it? Ethyl chloride they spray on you. It's that free zone, you know. I can't even pronounce it. it keeps you from hurting, you know. <laughs> I, I call it that magic elixir that they spray and it sort of freezes the surface and uh, helps to eliminate the pain. It numbs it. Mike, I think, is going to be okay. He's going to shake it off and stay in there. Wilcox playing pitch and catch with Johnny Bench. And. Six to three, the score. We're in the last of the third. Baltimore leads it. Davy Johnson's on at first base now with two out, and the count, of course, is one strike to Cuellar as he fouled that ball at the plate and off his right foot. Wilcox's ready fastball is blown away, and it's one and one. One ball, one strike to Cuellar. They play Mike shaded just a bit to pull the ball toward right. Just a bit. Back with the pitch. Fastball is outside. It's two balls, one strike. Two and one to Mike Cuellar, who owns a three-run lead in this fifth game of the 1970 World Series. Last year, he won the only game Baltimore won. Four to one in the open against the Mets. Wilcox ready and swing and a miss by Cuellar. It's 2-2. Two -two. Last year, he worked in 16 innings against the Mets, allowed a total of two runs on 13 hits. Today, he has given up three runs on four hits. Fastball is outside, and now Wilcox has gone all the way on Mike Cuellar. And with two out, Amy Johnson on this 3-2 pitch will be off and running from first base. He already scored twice in this inning. Merv Redman drove in Boo Powell, and then Davy Johnson drove in Redman. There's the ball, and it is hit high and foul to the right side, into the seats. Narrowly missing, going into the upper deck and back to first base. Now Johnson drops back to first. Three and two. Johnson walks off at first. May not holding him there. Wilcox stares into Johnny Bench. Now throws, foul, behind the plate, and it's still 3-2. Cincinnati, three runs in the first inning. Baltimore came back with two in the first, two in the second. They have scored two here in the third. That lead at 6-3. to three. Not an unpleasant dead off. Wilcox whirls and throws. As we said, May is playing behind the bag and took the throw about six feet from the bag. On Scudell against that extra base hit. Here's the pitch and it's strike three as Fayar swings and misses. Two run score on three base hits. There are no errors, one left, and Milt Wilcox did quite a job. At the end of three, Baltimore six, Cincinnati three. One, two, Back when Gillette introduced the famous Look Sharp March, nobody dreamed of the advances to come in shaving comfort. Stainless steel, super stainless, and now platinum. Today, Gillette uses a platinum alloy to smooth the edge of Gillette Platinum Plus Play. Smoother edge means smoother shaves, closer, with even more comfort. Learn what it feels like to shave with Gillette's best play. Gillette Platinum Plus, double edge or injector. Grab in your razor today. Well, it's six runs, eight hits, and no errors for Baltimore. Three runs, four hits, and no errors for the Reds after one-third of Game 5. As one of America's major trade unions, the Retail Clerks International Association brings the benefits of democracy to the place of employment of more than 600,000 store workers with good wages and good working conditions. The Retail Clerks Unions, believing in the democratic process of the government, urge all Americans to vote on November 3rd. This message from the Retail Store Employees Union in your community chartered by the Retail Clerks International Association, Washington, D.C., 20006. Jim, i got to read this. A 
down on the scoreboard, it says, nothing personal understand. The town of Cincinnati's grand. There are nice hotels and fine new parks, exciting nightlife after dark. But even though the street we'd like, we'd really rather not go back. <laughs> got to be signed the Baltimore Orioles. You read poetry well. <laughs> they are is warming up. Lee May is due up. And is standing off the plate along with Hal McGray, the second man up in the inning. And now Lee May, who has been doing everything for the Cincinnati Reds that could be asked of him, doubled on the Number first pitch. Number 23. Back in the first May. inning, he scored one of the three Cincinnati runs. And, of course, he has two home runs and eight RBIs and a 429 average beat four today. Bayard's going to try to work on him now. Throws a big breaking pitch that stays outside. It's ball one to Lee Minnick. Six runs, eight hits, no errors for Baltimore. Three runs, four hits, and no errors for Cincinnati. Lee May has hit safely in every game. Bayard is ready. Breaking pitch, and he's got him swinging. Foul tip at the plate. Ball went into the dirt, so Edgar Grant asked for a new one. May now is the only hitter who has hit safely in every game, including today. Now, uh, Brooks Robinson and Bobby Tolan have a chance to do that, but they haven't hit yet. May, big, strong, right-handed hitter. Cuellar's back with a fastball. and catches the inside corner. One ball, two strikes. Seldom to use fastball at Cuellar as he throws mostly breaking pitches. Roninger is up and throwing again for Cincinnati. One ball, two strike pitch. Breaking pitch stays outside. He changed a little bit on that screwball and ran it away from May, but it missed. It's two balls, two strikes. Robinson near the line at third base. What a job he has done on Lee May. When Lee May hasn't hit the ball to Brooks, he is really there. He hits the ball to Brooks, backhanded and back to third base. And now they're going to throw on as May does not run out and may have hurt himself. He fell down right at the plate, went down to one knee. Part of play made by Brooks Robinson, but the fact that Lee May didn't run took the excitement away from it, but what a backhanded stop by Brooks Robinson. Lee slipped and fell in the uh, 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 mud at the plate, uh, Jim, and uh, I guess his spikes just gave way. Here's Hal McRae, who doubled in two runs back in the first inning, hits the first pitch. It is high. Brooks Robinson comes over. Now Mark Belanger, fair territory, down the line in left field, and takes a high pop-up. Cuellar started off giving up three runs and four hits in the first inning. He has been hit hard on several occasions since, but he has now retired the last nine men in a row. And despite the fact that he has hit himself with a batted ball on his foot or shin, is pitching very well. They already throw to Tommy Helms now. It's outside and low ball one. Helms grounded the short to end the first inning. Robinson had made another one of those passive backhanded stops, and his throw to first base would have been from foul territory. Fastball high. Cuellar is calling it as the pitcher, telling everybody, Boo Cowles to take this one, and everybody starts going to, and he's got it. And that's the easiest inning of all so far from Mike Cuellar. He goes to the last of the fourth inning, Baltimore leading Cincinnati 6 to 3. When you have an opportunity to build a, a new line of cars from the wheels up, the better way, the more expensive way, but the better way is to design the two doors, one kind of car, and the four door sedan and station wagon as a completely different car. In our intermediate line, a two door is one kind of car. A four door sedan and the beautiful new uh, wagon are an entirely different kind. Drive a 1971 Dodge Charger or Plymouth Satellite Sebring Hardtop, and you'll get a two door designed for comfort, style, and beauty. No compromise. Drive a Dodge Coronet or Plymouth Satellite four-door sedan or wagon, and you'll get the extra roominess and entry ease that you want. Hardtops designed as hardtops. Sedans and wagons designed as sedans and wagons. Extra value and worth. Extra care and engineering. See the new 71s at your Dodge or Chrysler Plymouth dealers now. Cincinnati right-hand hitters would be getting a home run. 
He's given up uh, quite a few this year. He allowed 34 during the 1970 season, which is one about uh, every 8.8 innings. But uh, so far, Mr. Cuellar, coming back after a shaky start, has looked better and better as the innings go by. Mark Belanger singled in a run back in the second inning with his second hit of the series. He is one for two today. He fouled out in the first inning. He is the leadoff batter in the oil lineup, and he's leading off this last of the fourth inning, facing Milt Wilcox, the right-hander who throws the fastball in the corner. It's strike one. Wilcox, 20 years old, born in Hawaii. Ready to throw. Hit on the fists and fouled back. It's strike two to the last one. Well, Baltimore has twice as many runs as Cincinnati, six to three, and twice as many hits as Cincinnati, eight to four. Two strikes to Belanger with Paul Blair, who was at a perfect day on deck. Wilcox ready to throw, comes back with a breaking pitch, tying away, and it's one ball, two strikes. Looks better now as far as the skies and the weather's concerned than it has at any time of day. Fastball is fouled out of play. It's still one and two to Belanger. In case you're just joining us, this game started in a drizzle. It rained most of the morning here in Baltimore. There was serious question. They even had uh, the rules of what was going to happen if it were rained out or if it got started, played to a tie, and then rained out. One ball, two strikes. Outside with the pitch is 2 2, but right now it looks as though they'll get this game in with ease, which means that there must be a thunder cloud right behind the stadium when I play that game. It usually happens that way. Two balls, two strikes. Wilcox ready, throws the fastball, ground ball to the right side. Helms charges it, picks it up, throws over to first, and Belanger is out by six or seven steps. One out of the fourth, and Paul Blair, who single and scored ahead of Frank Robinson's sixth World Series home run of his career, in the first inning. Blair up. And in the second inning, he hit a fastball and lined it to left field to drive in Andy Etcheverry with the second run of that inning and tie the game up. First pitch from Wilcox is outside, ball one to Blair. Right now, Jim Blair has more hits than anybody on the Orioles. Big curve, and it drops right over. Strike one. One ball, one strike to Blair. I shouldn't say more hits. He's 8 for 17, while Brooks Robinson is 8 for 18. One and one. Foul tip, caught by Bench. It's one ball, two strikes. Blair took a good cut at that ball. Playing Blair for the full hitter is the outfield of the Reds, shaded around to the left. Wilcox has done an excellent job. He's retired three in a row since being called on to bail out Granger. Now, that breaking pitch went over the head of Blair, who simply bent down at the plate, and it sailed right where his head would have been. But it was not a hard-thrown ball, but rather just a big breaking pitch that must have slipped off the hand of Bill Wilcox. The ball's two strikes. Wilcox ready. Rose comes back with a fastball, but misses outside. It's now three and two to Blair. Speaking of pitches that get away, how about that one of Jim Palmer's over in Cincinnati? It went within 30 feet of the plate. It went toward the foul line and more toward third base than toward home as it slipped out of his hand. Three and two. Wilcox throws and strikes him out swinging. Second strikeout for young Milt Wilcox. is now retired four in a row. Baltimore leads six to three, win the last of the fourth, and here is Frank Robinson, who hit a home run in the first inning with Van on and five and center in the second. When they were down three to nothing in the first inning, it is Robinson that brought the birds back and got them on the scoreboard with a home run. Boniger again gets up and starts the throw for the Reds. Sparky Anderson can use everybody today because if he doesn't win, there's a strike with the fastball at the knees. There's no tomorrow, and of course, you'll worry about whom to pitch tomorrow after he wins today. That's not the problem. A one strike pitch from Milt Wilcox in the dirt. Picked up on the first half by Bench. One ball, one strike. Baltimore leads it by three in this fifth game of the 1970 World Series. Six to three. One and one. Back with the breaking pitch and Robinson swings and misses. It's strike two. One ball, two strikes. The breeze, what there is, 
There doesn't seem to be much where we are, but there is some out there going towards center. One ball, two strikes. Robinson stands out for a moment, and it looks as though he may have hurt his left hand swinging at that breaking pitch. And now steps back in. He's ready. And a fastball is lined off Wilcox's rip, picked up by Perez at third base, went on the bay, and he's got it. But Rip took a, uh, Wilcox took a shot right in the ribs, the ball line, and caromed over. The trainer is out immediately. Perez picked it up and threw him up. No run, Cicero's done left. End to four. Baltimore, six, Cincinnati, three. This is Kurt Gowdy. You know, a game like this is always a thrill for me because it's a chance to watch the best baseball in the world. It's performance with a capital P, and I'm big on performance. That's why I recommend that you take your car to the performance stop, the Phillips 66 station. They've got performance products with a capital P, like Phillips Flight Fuel Premium Gasoline, the high-performance gasoline that gives you all the power you need, yet keeps your engine running clean. And Phillips Top Arctic Motor Oil with its exclusive detergent additive. And Phillips PGB tires, the performance tires. Now take a tip from me and stop in at the performance stop, the Phillips 66 station nearest you. And when you do, just tell them that Kurt Gowdy sent you. Remember, at Phillips 66, it's performance that counts. With Jim Simpson, Jim McIntyre at Memorial Stadium in Baltimore, and Sparky Anderson has made up his mind that Milt Wilcox will not bat. In the fifth inning, Angel Bobo has selected a bat, come up to the on-deck circle to hit after Dave Concepcion, who's going to be the leadoff man. And uh, we are a little bit concerned about Milt Wilcox and that line shot Robinson hit back to him. He did not look like he was hurt seriously. He walked off the mound under his own power. But we hope to have a report from the Reds uh, clubhouse shortly. For the fifth inning, here again, Jim Simpson. It's up to right hand at batter. Pop to Johnson at second. It was only at the time at bat. That was back in the second inning. And Cuellaro has retired 10 in a row throws. And Concepcion fouls this one off to the right. Now this becomes a very important inning. Not because who's at bat, but once it is completed, this is an official World Series game. Barring, of course, the fact that uh, the Reds go out in front and then Baltimore must bat in their half of the fifth inning. Strike one to Concepcion, grounded off his fists and down the line at third. Brooks Robinson comes over in foul territory, and Billy Williams, the umpire, says he wants to look at it, and he keeps the ball in play. Two strikes to Concepcion. Bravo, who has been up a couple of times but failed to reach base, as Jim McIntyre said, waits on deck to bat for Wilcox. We are as ready. Ground ball towards short. Belanger is in. Picks it up. Guns the ball on the first base and has Concepcion by the deck. Milt Wilcox has five men. One and two-thirds innings. And nobody reached base against him. Bravo. Bravo over two. Series. Last year, meaning 1969, he was playing with Tucson out of the Pacific Coast League and led the league in hitting with 348. One out, top of the fifth, six to three, Baltimore Cuellar ready, throws the ball low and away. In the dirt, Bravo. It's ball one. Bravo had no home runs, not a power hitter, three RBIs and 277 average during the regular season this year. Left-handed batter, Cuellar throws, and it's down low. Now, Sparky Anderson has Darrell Chaney, a switch hitter, who could hit. Bernie Carbo, of course, who hit 310 as a rookie, is an also a left-handed batter, and he has sent up the left-handed Bravado to face the left-handed Cuellar. This pitch is in the dirt, and it's ball three, and Bravo is on his way to drawing a walk. Jimmy Stewart is also available for pinch hitting, and he, too, like Cheney, is a switch hitter. Ty Klein is a left-hander, like Bravo. And Cuellar, of course, is a left-hander. This one is right down the middle, and it's 3-1. Cuellar was really having trouble with his first three pitches. Missing big, but this fastball is down the middle, and Bravo was taking all away. Three balls, one strike. 
They are ready. Throws another fastball at the knee. Three and two. And now Bravo, who had a count of three and zero, oh, has been taking the last two pitches. It's three and two, and now with a close hands of his, steps in against Cuellar, who throws, and it's off the corner, and Bravo draws the walk. That's the first base on balls given up by Mike Cuellar. Six to three, the score, Baltimore, as Bobby Tolan, who has struck out and grounded the pal at first, comes up. Number 28. Speaking Bobby of left-handers against Tolan. left-handers, as it's been pointed out throughout the season, throughout the World Series, Tolan has either been the best or the second best hitter against left-handers since joining the Reds. Grounds this ball foul. Strike one. And it was Tolan that Earl Weaver brought in Pete Rickard for at the last half of the ninth inning down in Cincinnati. And Rickard got him on the line drive at the shortstop. Despite the fact that uh, Rickard was left-hander, Earl Weaver said, yes, I knew that he goes well against left-handers. This pitch is inside. It's one and one. But I felt I had to go my, with my best. My best is Pete Rickard. Baltimore's got that bullpen going. Again, they'd like to wrap it up right here now. Tom Thebus, who was a questionable starter when the series started for this uh, a series starting assignment, has appeared in relief, is out there working now. Tolan tries to duck away from this pitch and fouls it off. It was high and in on him. And he's mad at himself because it's not ball two, it's strike two. One ball, two strikes. Tolan with Bravo on at first base, one out, top of the fifth. Jim, that ball almost hit former commissioner William Mecker. Mayar stares in. Here's the pitch. Hit to the opposite field. Redman is there, and he has to move a step or two to his right. That's all. And passes for the second out. Well, Tolan is 0 for 3. Here is Pete Rose, who doubled and scored in the first inning and grounded to Johnson at second in the third. Well, yesterday, the Baltimore Orioles were cruising along much the same way, figuring they were going to wrap up the World Series in four straight. And then Mr. Lee May hit a three-run home run in, in the eighth inning, and it was all over. So this game is not all over yet by a long shot. Rose looks as if to bunt. It's a strike. Robinson was breaking in from third. He, of course, in this situation, trying to bunt his way on, getting two men on base and bringing up the powerful Tony Perez to swing away. They are set. Rose waits. Here's the pitch. Fastball, and he falls down as he swings up. A big cut. First of all, he was trying to bunt his way on to get two men on base at that time. He had one thing in mind. Get that ball out of here. Two strikes to Rose. More than 200 hits for the fifth time in his last six seasons this year. They are ready. Comes back with the ball in on him. And it's ball one. Just misses. Some of the fans behind the plate, and of course we are in Baltimore, so often three yards pitch was on the inside corner of the plate. On ball, two strikes. Dallas first, Johnson second, Belanger short, Robinson third, Reckman in left, Blair in center. There's a foul to the screen. Frank Robinson right, Echebert the catcher, and Cuellar the pitcher. He has gone all the way. He has not allowed a hit since the first inning retired 11 men in a row before he gave up the walk to Bravo. The one two pitch, line to right field. Back goes Frank Robinson. He has it in range, picks up his one and has it to third out. All right, Mr. Harris, one man left as we go to the last of the fifth. Baltimore leads Cincinnati 6 to 3 with Jim McIntyre, Tony Kloniker, who started a World Series game. Has come on to pitch this fifth inning here. He is behind six to three, meaning he and the rest of the Cincinnati Reds. The Baltimore would score two runs in each of the first three innings, and more importantly, when you stare down at what has gone on, Cincinnati hasn't been able to muster a base hit since the first inning against Mike Poyard. They are in the sixth inning, must again face such folks as Perez, Bench, and May that started it all yesterday. Right now it is Baltimore's turn at bat. The players like Cal, Redman, and Robinson. And with the rain set very much with us today, although it looks as though it's clearing here now in Baltimore, we'll remind you once again, this is now an official World Series baseball game, regardless of what the rains may do. 
Boone Powell steps in. Last of the fifth inning, the voice of the Cincinnati Reds is Jim McIntyre. All right, Jim Simpson. Tony started Tuesday's game and was the loser. With five and a third innings, he faces Big Boot Powell and breaks the curve up high, ball one. Tony went uh, five and a third, last six hits, and five runs Tuesday, and he was the loser. He's the fourth Cincinnati pitcher used today. Strong, hard-throwing right-hander facing Powell. Fires a fastball, he pops it up. Back of third, Perez drifts over toward the line, comes in a bit and takes it, and there's one man up. As Jim mentioned several times, there's no tomorrow for the Cincinnati Reds. It's do or die to say, or uh, go home and take out spring training 1971. Here's Merv Rettman, the left fielder. One for two. A single in the uh, third inning, a bouncer up the middle that uh, batted in a run. And he later came around to score on a hit by uh, Davey Johnson. Conninger works to him. Swung on and popped up down the right field line. Maybe a play on the ball. May, Rose, and nobody can get it. It's out of play. Foul ball. One strike. Tony Cloninger was not counted upon by the Cincinnati Reds in their starting rotation until uh, injuries and uh, things began to happen. And Tony was pressed into the starting rotation and came through with nine wins and seven losses for the year. Redman takes the slider for a strike call and it's 0-2. One out, last pass of the fifth inning. The Orioles six and the Reds three. And Mr. Cuellar looks great after the first inning. Redman steps away from the pitch. He almost stepped into that fastball and one ball, two strikes. Conninger is the 16th pitcher the Reds have paraded to the mound in the 1970 World Series. Two to Redmond, one out, not on. Fifth inning, Baltimore batting. Here's the pitch. Swing and a foul back, out of play. Merritt went an inning and two thirds. Ranger pitched one third of the second inning and one third of the third. Wilcox worked uh, an inning and two thirds, and now we have Ponyer. fires and Rettman takes the ball outside a slider that missed. Tony has had control problems this season as well as in previous years. He's averaged 4.7 walks per nine innings this season. His lifetime National League averaged four walks per nine, per nine inning game. Big strong hard throwers and gets this pitch low a fastball to make it three and through. Tony uh, for the lead in the National League for bases on balls in 1965 when he gave up 119. And in 66, he led the league, issuing 116 walks. Three and two to Redmond, and he fouls it back, upper deck, out of play. Deep and left. Tolan shaded a bit toward left and center and rose straight away and right. Here's the 3 2 again. Swung on and fouled away again. Out of play off the right field line. And Billy Williams looks around for the uh, fat boy. And the ball boy will be sure he gets some more baseballs in a hurry. 3 and 2. Conninger, a deep breath, wide, kicks, and here it is. Swung on a fly ball, deep down the right field line, and in the corner, that could be trouble. Robinson taking one inside ball. 
Brooks is run for two today, and eight for 18 in the series, including two homers and two doubles.
he got too much wood behind the ball, but it's right back on a bounce to Carninger. He made the play to bench, and the relay to May was not in time as Coy R. beat the throw. So they forced the runner to place uh, two men out at the top of the order coming up on Black.
Might have let a question or a limit come through for you. Well, we go to the sixth inning. Paul Blair, Frank Robinson, and Bill Powell, and Tony Plotiker, who came on in the fifth inning and was roughed up for a home run by Redmond. And a couple more base hits, and had the base loaded with one out, but wiggled out with any further damage. We'll try not to allow the Orioles to increase that four-run lead. Four is too much as it is. And this do-or-die game for the Reds are down three games to one. Blair steps in against Plotiker, and here again is Jim McIntyre. Thank you, Jim. He's at two for three today, a couple of singles, right-hand batter, first pitch. Got a strike on the outside part of the play. The most runs batted in by a player in a five-game World Series is eight. Dan Murphy has put it out the A's in 1910. Conninger misses with a slider, ball one. If the World Series ends today, Lee May would tie that record. Provided, uh, well, he might break it if he gets a run batted in here today. There's a ball high and inside. Another slider. Conninger has thrown a lot of sliders. That's fastball. I haven't seen him break off a curveball yet. On deck, Frank Robinson. Washburn gets up again at Cincinnati bullpen. There's a very high foul back to the right and out of play. Bench turned around, looked up, and I think for a moment lost the ball. Then he finally found it and it was going to be out of play anyway. Two balls, two strikes. Paul Blair leading off the last half of the sixth inning with the Orioles with a big lead, 7-3. to three. Three of the first four games have been thrillers, and this one has had its share, too. There's a slider outside, ball three, three balls, two strikes. Blair's not very big in his uh, big man physically, but he's got tremendous power, good power. Three and two, Cloninger with a payoff delivery, found it back to the screen, stays alive, three, two. have been batted in today, one each by Belanger and Blair, two by Frank Robinson, two by Merv Rettman, and one by Davy Johnson. There's another foul to the backstop, and it's fixed in the screen, and the count remains three balls, two strikes. Today's crowd is not as big as yesterday, which was the largest of the series so far, 53,007. There are empty seats here today. Now the pitch. Swung on and foul back. Flying <laughs> over. Three and two. Walk for a low outside and pitch. Book that's the call. Second walk allowed by Conninger. The Orioles put the first batter up on base in the sixth inning, and we get Frank Robinson strolling up. Up at one last of a uh, Jim Mayer's curveball. High, way up, and deep in left field in the first inning, scoring Blair ahead of him. He flies to center field in the second inning, and line one off uh, Bill Wilcox's ribcage is carried over to Perez in the fourth inning, and Tony threw him out. So he's one for three. For first, just a token flip over there. Blair has good speed lead and might try to steal the stretch in the pitch. Swing it a minute, strike one. Paul Blair stole 24 bases for Baltimore this season. He was their leading base thief. And you can't tell Earl Weaver might uh, put on the hit and run at any time because Robinson is so adept at that maneuver. Conninger kicks right out of his spice. Blair leads. May holds the corner on him. A throw with her runs him back. Washburn continues to throw in the Cincinnati bullpen. All right, Conninger, quick throw to first, and Blair has to come back in and out stretch. Base. Strike to Frank Robinson. Blair at first. Last time of the six, seven to three. Time called at the plate. Robinson wasn't set. Conninger was going to quick pitch him if he could. All right, the stretch. The pitch. 
There's a slider in the dirt, bouncing away from Bench, and Blair doesn't try to go. The ball bounced away from Johnny Bench and off to the third base side, and Paul Blair played it safe, didn't try to go. Jumps off. Boninger gets the sign to the belt. One and one. Swung on, foul back. One ball, two strikes. Nobody has said anything about six game pitchers. Earl Weaver just believes the Orioles are going to do it here today. There will be no return trip to Cincinnati. Rocky Anderson figures he doesn't know who's going to pick a six game. So right into his one. Fastball struck him out. Robinson fans on a high fastball. That's Finder's first strike. Now here's Luke Powell. A 
a change-up curve is low to McRae. Uh, to, uh, Ball two. Two balls, one strike. Down the line, two and one on the way. Popped up, foul. Back of the plate to the left. That's your turn. Coming back, gets under it, and takes it. One out of the center inning, and now 17 out of 18 batters. Poyars put down. You look at Tommy Helms, who was 0 for 2. He's granted the short and popped up the first. Maybe Concepcion will be next. Donnelly and now Feeling off his jacket again. The bullpen for the Reds is Ray Washburn. That would seem to indicate a consider for Cloninger if either Helms or Concepcion get off base. Tommy takes a strike. The screwball is at the outside part of the plate.
McIntyre, Jim Simpson back at Memorial Stadium in Baltimore. Ray Washburn, a right-hander, and the fifth pitcher for Cincinnati strides across the foul line, heading for the mound, and he will pitch to the Baltimore Orioles in the seventh inning. Seven to three the score. And looking ahead for Cincinnati because time is indeed running out. If they do not score at least four runs in the next two innings, this ball game is all over. Then remember, in the eighth inning yesterday was when lightning struck. The score was five to three until Lee May hit that three-run home run to put Cincinnati in front. And they went on to win their first and only victory of this 1970 World Series. And looking ahead to the eighth inning, Cincinnati in the eighth and ninth innings will get a full shot at getting those runs back. Because Bobby Tolan, the leadoff man in the Cincinnati lineup, will lead it off in the eighth. And they've got from the top of the batting order on to try to recoup those four runs and tie it up. In the meantime, and we don't wish to belabor a point, but it's the way pitchers think, the way managers think, the way baseball people think. At this moment, with a four-run lead, it is possible that Cincinnati could send the tying run to play. That would be the man at bat if the base is loaded. But if Baltimore can manage a run, then that can never happen. That's what the Orioles would love to do in the seventh and eighth, and that is open that four-run bulge a little bit more and go on to win their second world championship since 1966 when they swept the Dodgers four in a row. Last year, of course, they lost after winning the first one four in a row to the Mets, meaning five games altogether. They're trying to win this five-game set. Davey Johnson, Andy Echeverin, and Mike Cuellar, who was in a bit of trouble at the top of the inning, will bat here in the last of the seventh. Again, Jim McIntyre. Well, with the appearance of Ray Washburn, Jim, all the Cincinnati pitchers who had ever appeared in World Series competition have been on the mound here today. Merritt, Granger, and now Washburn, who started and relieved uh, Tuesday World Series with the St. Louis Cardinals. Right-hander works, and it's hit right up back to him. He takes it on one out, knocks it down, picks it up, and throws out and Davey Johnson. They made one pitch and gets one but out. That's the first time Johnson has been retired today. One out in the seventh inning for the board and experience to play. Another eight. Washburn for a lot of threads this year. Born in Pasco, Washington. Has 695 run run average of 35. Wines pitching to experience the ball long outside. He pitched in four games for the Cardinals. In the 1967 and 1968 series. And he won one and lost one. That's the Baron takes again. Outside, ball two. Two balls, no strikes. On deck, pitcher Mike Cuellar. And when he walks up to it, the plate, you should hear a big round of applause. Washburn into the wide up in the pitch. A swing and a miss, strike one. Two and one. Washi is the uh, fifth Cincinnati pitcher of today's fifth game. He's two and one to Lex Barrett and throwing. Ball three, outside, fastball, three balls, one strike. Three one pitch is ball four, too high. He walks. The fourth walk of Cincinnati pitchers today. And here's Mike Coyar and a nice round of applause. Some of the uh, Baltimore fans back at the Baltimore dugout to our left behind third base standing up to applaud Mike. He's deserving of it. Got some left-handed. Washburn's first one. It is struck one call, letter high, inside edge, and uh, Mr. Cuellar did not indicate he was going to punt. He checks with Billy Hunter at third base again and steps back up. That's your very first one man out. Washburn has his signal. There it is. He's going to punt this time and does. Third base side. Picked up by Washburn. Whips it to May in time at first for the up. And on the sacrifice, that the Baron moves to second. <laughs> Two down now. Runner on second. And Mark Belanger, who batted in a run with a single left field in the second inning. 
One for four. Steps up to the plate. Number seven, Mark Lamenter. Mark will take his time getting set to the batter spots to allow Cuellar to get back to the dugout. Hatcher Barrett, second with a short lead. Washburn gets his side as Badger gets set. Washy stretches and throws. A swing and a bouncer off the pitcher's left. Cam's off to Hells. He's up with it. Over to May. And that retires the sun. No runs, no hits, no errors. A man who walked left on. At the end of seven, it's the Orioles seven and the Reds three. Still coming, gets under it, and takes his party up. One down in the eighth inning for the Cincinnati Reds. Pete Rose steps in with a double and three at-bats. He's grounded out and flying out to right field. He'll be followed by Tony Guerrero. the windup, first pitch to Rose. Swung on, ground ball, it's short. The plays it, up with it, over to foul, two out. Ball is hit sharply, but right at the Lancer. Third two out in the Cincinnati eighth, and here's Perez. Tony has hit it hard twice. He fired high to left in the first. Lined to Redmond in left field in the third. And Belanger made a leaping one-handed stab of a hard hit line drive in the sixth. He takes a ball a little bit high. On deck, Johnny Bench, and it will come Lee May. Seven to three, Baltimore, eighth inning. Cuellar delivers. Swung on and popped up. In the middle of the diamond. Shortstop Belanger behind the mound, takes it, and that ball for the Reds of the Oak. Nothing was wrong. In the middle of the eighth inning, it's Baltimore, and the Orioles seven, the Reds three. Jim Simpson with Jim McIntyre. Uh, Baltimore win the last of the eighth inning. The Orioles hitting seven to three, and they've got the heart of their lineup coming up. And they three Washburn and Paul Blair, Frank Robinson, and Drew Powell. And this World Series might be ending soon. Who knows? Here's Jeff. Blair takes a strike call on the outside corner. Blair is two for three today. Two singles. Struck out and walked. Scored once. Batted in one. Right hand hitter. Takes an off speed. Pitch for a call. Strike two. Washburn pulled the string all the way. Oh, and two. On deck is Frank Robinson to be followed by Booth Powell. Last of the eighth inning. Washi gets his signal and throws. Ball one, a little bit high. Well, they flashed a sign on the scoreboard out here, the message board. Could be prophetic. Next home game, Wednesday, April 7th, Orioles versus Senator. Where it takes again, ball two, high away, off speed. Two balls, two strikes. You must know that's the opening game for Baltimore in 1971. Two balls, two strikes. Now the pitch. Swing and a foul back. Looks like it might start raining at any time. The clouds are getting darker. It's a good thing we got the lights on right now. We need them. Two balls, two strikes to Blair. Eight inning. Seven to three, Baltimore. Here's the pitch. Swing the slow grounder wide up there. Not going to hold up with a concession, but he's two headed right for the throw. Now the 
stretch and the pitch and they ball too low. Nobody warming up in the Reds bullpen at the moment. But just now, Clay Carroll gets to his feet. Two balls, no strikes to Robinson. Riley is in the pitch. Swing the ground ball in the right field. Yesterday's game 
is called on to relieve today and get the last two Oriole outs in the eighth. Now, Jim, you pointed it out, a very big run. In the ninth inning, with Bench, May, and McGray due up, look at it this way. As long as there's that big five-run lead, uh, Cincinnati can never bring up against Mike Cuellar or his relief the winning run. Johnny Bench can hit a home run, Lee May can hit a home run, Hal McGray can hit a home run, so can Tommy Helm. Uh, they still got that one-run lead. So five runs means an awful lot in the way you pitch a ball game. Brooks Robinson. Yeah. All right, Clay Carroll, who was the winner yesterday, wants to call time and do a little gardening out in front of the rubber to plant his foot before he faces Brooks Robinson. One for four today, a single. First pitch to him. Swung on a high fly down the left field line, twisting, curving, and it's going to be fouled out of play. Hey, Pan made a nice catch leaning over the railing down there, and he has a 1970 World Series souvenir. One strike to Robinson on deck, Dave Johnson. Carroll, the sixth pitcher used by Sparky Anderson in an effort to stem the Orioles in game five. Takes his stretch. Now, as his pitch is swung out of this strike two and a good fastball. I imagine that fastball fools Brooks Robinson a little bit. Clay had a lot behind that one. He's 0 and 2 and firing. Swung on foul back. Well, little did I realize that when I asked uh, Clay about uh, pitching today, and I don't think he realized it, that he would be called on. Nothing of two. Robinson checks the swing on a breaking pitch in the dirt, blocked by the runners hold, one ball, two strikes. Eight runs, 14 hits for the Orioles. And there's still a fact. Three runs, six hits for the Reds, and they got four of those six hits in the first inning. One and two, it's his foul back. To be on the plate. Robinson throughout this series has been the picture of... Like he is every effort. To excel, which he was certainly. Pitch to it. Strike three call. He took a. For something else. He was caught out of. The strike not listen to the crowd. For Brooks Robinson, they dug out being called out on strike. That's how much they love the Brooks in Baltimore. Johnson, two out, two men on, and here's Cal with his first off. He missed with it outside, ball one. Johnson has singled and doubled, batted in one run, scored one. He's two for three on the day, and four for 15 in the series. Play ready, throwing. Swung and hit up the middle, that's a hit. Here's Frank Robinson heading around third. He'll score, and the Orioles lead nine to three. <laughs> the run scored by Frank Robinson is charged to Red Washburn. That's the 15th Baltimore hit. The third for Dave Johnson. <laughs>
Baltimore was just six outs away from a four-game sweep. But they didn't get it. Today, they are three outs away from the 1970 World Championship. Let's see if they get it. Johnny Bench, one for three on the day, and a run-producing single in the first inning steps up. And here's Cuellar's first offer. He got it inside, let her high ball away. Well, at last out there, as Andy Etchbear took a half swing, the plate up and called it a ball. The first base up by Emmett Ashford called it a swinging strike. High bench. Bills had fouled over the head of Alex Ramos' birthday. And Alex was hauling in his neck. Third base like that. Nobody has until Brooks Rock. That's right. Three man. 